Oh, you probably slipping. shouldn't be hey. this close to the edge. Ah! Oh. Oh, you all right? Oh, where are they taking him, man? Uh, How do we get back up there? Oh, you know what? Over here. I, I don't know. Can... I don't know what to do. Over here, look. Should we climb up here? Yeah, come on. Just... Okay. Ah, okay. There we go. There we... Oh, look. Oh, hey, man. look. I'm slipping again. I'm, I, I, Jerry. Can't, I can't hang on. Jerry, the, the view from up here is amazing. I can't get back up there. Yes, you can. Just climb. I don't know. I'm gonna go this way. I don't think that's I a think good. I found a shortcut. No, I don't think there's there's something. No, no. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try it. Jerry, I'm I gonna say, stay down no, here. Jerry. Hey, look at this dog. No! <laughs> oh, Jerry, it was a good grade. <laughs> I don't know where I'm gonna find my friends. <laughs> Uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, climbing up the gate again. <laughs> oh, Jerry. <sighs> Pull it together, where are they? <laughs> not out here, not in here, not in there. <sighs> oh, I feel better. <sighs> oh, this is scary. They're definitely not down here. Let's get out of here as quick as possible. Hey, what was that? Ah! Hey, guys, I see him! I see him! I'm coming, guys. Just stay right there. Oh, this is comfy. Oh, there. I, I hear him. Guys! Guys, I'm back! I'm back! It's so good to see you again. Hey, weren't there two of you guys? Oh, yeah, Jerry's dead. Uh, okay. Um, can you guys hear me? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. If that doesn't explain what the series is about, I'm not sure that I can help you at all. Um, but welcome to 514 Church. We're glad that everybody's here today. My name is John McCambridge, and I have the honor and the privilege today of kicking off this brand new series called Grapes. And this is a series that, as Joel mentioned, is all about community. And so this is all about what it means to connect with people, to be in meaningful relationships with one another. And we're going to unpack why we think this is so important to the Christian faith. What, what this means, why we set up our community the way that we do. And most importantly, how you can get more connected into the 514 Church community right now today. And this series is actually not the only time that we're going to be talking about community and connecting. We're actually going to be spending the next three months talking about it because this series kicks off an entire season that's called the Connect Season. And so for the next three months, we're going to be talking about and focusing on community and what it means to be in meaningful relationships with one another in this church and why that's so important. So I am excited to get into that, to get into the meat of what we're going to be talking about. But before we do, I would like to share a little bit about myself and my life. I, I grew up here in Columbus, Ohio, and so I was born and raised here. And I had an opportunity for college to go down to Cincinnati and to go to Xavier University. And so I went to Xavier University, and I got my degree there, and I got my education there, and I had a chance to play baseball there. And one of the biggest blessings of having an opportunity to play baseball was that I got a scholarship, and so I went to school for free, which was, which was amazing. Um, one of the unintended consequences of playing baseball full-time and going to school full-time is that you have no other time to have a job, which means that you have no other time to make money, which means that you have no money. And so for four years, I literally had zero dollars. <laughs> I was broke, like not like normal, everybody's been there broke, but like, you know, $2.50 can get your debit card declined in front of your friends broke. And so that's like broke, broke. And when you live like that kind of broke, you start to develop strategies as to what you should do with money when you do come across it. So your mom ends up putting $20 in your bank account. Your grandma gives you $50 for your birthday. How are you going to spend that money? Because you can't save it. There's not enough of it. You have to live. So how are you going to spend it? And you start to develop strategies and prioritizations. And for me, the most important thing to do with that money before anything else was to put gas in my car. All right? So this was 2007 through 2011. And the car that I was driving at the time was a 1992 Land Rover Discovery, which is a cool car. All right? It looks like the Jurassic Park vehicle. It's sweet. But this one in particular <laughs> didn't really work. And I don't know what swap meet my father brought, bought this car from or the way in which he fixed it up, but he gave it to me. 
and it had a bad fuel pump. And so I'd be at a stoplight and the car would start to idle and it'd start to idle low and it'd start to shake and it'd stall. And this was an automatic, so I wasn't stalling it. It was just stalling. And because the fuel pump, it's not that easy to just turn it back on. And so it'd stall for no reason and I'd have to like push it over to the side of the road and this happened frequently. It had a giant moon roof which is part of what gave it its Jurassic Park nature. You could stick multiple bodies out of the moonroof, uh, but it leaked. So when it rained, which in Ohio is most days, uh, visible streams of water would come into my car, and so I basically just covered my whole car in towels, and that was how I dealt with that problem instead of ever trying to fix it. Um, and uh, the most annoying thing about this car was that running at full efficiency on the highway, it got like six miles per gallon. And it was like a 20 gallon tank. And so it was impossible to keep gas in this thing. And so I would, that's what I would do first with money when I got it. And the second thing that I would do is buy food. And when you live you know, without money for long enough, you start to realize that the most important thing you can do with food is you have to find food that is both calorically dense and cheap, which is harder than you think. Because the rumor or, or the stereotype is that college kids subsist off of ramen noodles. And they are impossibly cheap. Like, I, I don't know what that business model looks like, but uh, they're like 20 cents a packet or something. But the problem is there's nothing in them at all except salt and MSG. So you eat them and you get very thirsty, but you don't really get full. And so I decided that, that I was done with that and I got off the ramen noodle train pretty early. And what I landed on was store brand peanut butter. Store brand peanut butter. Now you can't, you know, go into a grocery store like big baller status and get Jif, okay? You gotta get the store brand peanut butter and then you get the cheapest wheat bread that you can find and you spread the peanut butter on it and you have no honey, no jelly, nothing to make it palatable and you just kinda gum it down and you do that three times a day and there's your fats and your sugars and your carbs and some protein and that's a whole, that's a whole diet right there. That works. And so that's what I would do. Now, the circumstances at the time were that I was also living with a bunch of dudes. And when you live with a bunch of dudes, my senior year I did, you look back on that time and you were like, that is not an acceptable way for human beings to live. <laughs> there are lots of things about that that you look back and you're like, how is that okay with me and the five other people that I live with? But one of the things that happens when you live with a lot of guys is you never have proper eating utensils. Never. And so there were six of us and we had like two spoons <laughs> and two knives and like six forks, and we never did the dishes. So you can imagine it was just a struggle to find stuff to eat with. And so every time I wanted to make a peanut butter sandwich, I would have to figure out, what am I gonna spread this peanut butter with? And because we had more forks than anything else, I would inevitably end up with a fork and peanut butter and bread. And I would have to scoop the peanut butter with the fork and spread the peanut butter with the fork. And if you've ever tried to spread peanut butter with forks, it's very frustrating. Because it doesn't really work. It like doesn't scoop it very well. It doesn't wipe it on the bread very well. When you try to spread it, it like goes through the prongs and so it like rips the bread. It doesn't work. And so inevitably, instead of ever doing the dishes or buying silverware, I would just multiple times a day angrily make a peanut butter sandwich and then like rage eat it for a year. And I never made an adjustment. Now, when you look back on this story, and you want to look at it through like a philosophical lens, one question that you could ask yourself is what is it about the experience of trying to spread peanut butter with a fork that makes it so infuriating? Like what is it about that process of trying to do that that makes it so frustrating? And the answer is actually simple. The answer is that that fork was designed and created to fulfill a certain function, a specific function. It was designed to work in a certain way. It has three prongs and they're sharp. And so what it was designed to do is to stab food that's on the plate and then move it from the plate to your mouth. And when you use a fork in that way, in the way in which it was designed to function, in the way in which it was intelligently created to be, it's not frustrating at all. It works. It feels right. It feels good. But when you use the fork in a way in which it was not created to be used, to fulfill a function in which it was not ever created to fulfill, it's very, very frustrating. Very frustrating. Very frustrating. And one thing that we profess as Christians is that we believe that we live in a good world that was created by a good God, a good, benevolent, creative, intelligent God, and that means that there is a certain way that this world is supposed to function. 
There's a way that this world was created, a certain givenness, createdness to this world, a grain along which this world runs the way that it's supposed to run. And as creatures in God's creation, that means that there's a certain way that we are designed and created to function in God's good world. And when we live along that grain, when we live the way that we were created to live, when we worship what we were always designed to worship, and when we find fulfillment in that which was always designed to give us fulfillment, we flourish. As humans, living in this world, we flourish. Now, one of the tragedies of the human condition is that most of us spend most of our time grinding against the givenness of this world, grinding against the grain in which God created this living in ways that we were never designed to live, worshiping things that were never designed to receive our worship and looking for fulfillment in things that were never created to give it to us and we end up living these incredibly frustrating lives. There's a stereotype. It's called the midlife crisis. And stereotypically, it's a 40-year-old man who starts to make some strange purchasing decisions. And... uh, This is a very common phenomenon. And what happens is that we are told that if you live this way by society, if you do these things, if you achieve these things, if you attain these things, then you'll flourish and be fulfilled. And so we go to that school and we get that degree. And we go and we get that job and we put ourselves on that career trajectory. We have this wife, we have this family, and we put ourselves onto this retirement timeline. And if we do that, if that's what we do successfully, then we'll find fulfillment. And so we do. And then you start to attain those things and you start to have those things and you look around you and you have that job and you have that degree and you you have that career trajectory and that family and you take a step back and your life is half over and you're like, well, I'm not fulfilled at all. I don't feel like I'm flourishing at all. What is all this? And you buy a Ferrari. (laughs) And the reason that this is a crisis for us is because those things were never designed to give us fulfillment. Those things were never created to give us fulfillment. Those are inherently good things. Education, a means to provide, a family. Those are good things. They're great gifts, but they're terrible gods. Great gifts, terrible gods. And when we put them in the position of God, we're, we're living like we're forks trying to spread peanut butter. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating. And so at 514 Church, one conviction that we have very strongly is that when you look at the person of Jesus Christ, which is the reason that we gather together on Sundays, on the first day of every week, that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, when you look at him and what he means to us in our faith, it's more than just the cross. It's more than just the resurrection. It's more than just atonement, forgiveness of sins. It's more than all that. If that is God in the flesh, then the way that God lived as a human being, that has to be the right way to live. When you look at his life, if God became human and lived, that has to be the right way to live as a human. And so we look at his life and we try to imitate it. We become disciples of Jesus Christ. We start to go down this long road of transformation into the likeness of Christ. The word disciple simply means student. And so there's a student and there's a teacher. And in first century rabbinical culture, and Jesus was a first century rabbi, you had the rabbi, which is a teacher, And you have the disciple, which is the student. And the purpose of the student was not just to have knowledge and information imparted upon him. The purpose of the student was to become like the teacher. And so there's an old Hebrew saying uh, where they say that you are supposed to be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And what that means is that you follow him around so closely Because the point is to emulate him and imitate him. And you look at what he does and how he does it. And you're so close that he's kicking his dust up on you as he moves around in this world. And so you move around covered in the dust of your rabbi. And so as Christians, true discipleship are lives that begin to look like they're covered in the dust of Rabbi Jesus. Because we see him. We see what he does and we try to imitate that. And we try to become like Christ. That's discipleship. And so as a church here, one of the strategies that we have to try to lead people into that lifestyle of discipleship is this idea of seasons. And so what we've done is we've chosen four aspects. We say the four fundamentals or the four pillars of the Christian life. Um, We have a season of learning, a season of serving, a season of connecting or community, and a season of inviting, invitation. 
And we believe that when you focus on those things one at a time, three months, over and over and over again, that will start to be internalized within us and our lives will start to look like Jesus. And so the question for today is what is it about community? What is it about connecting and relationships that we think is non-negotiable and essential to the walk of a disciple who's covered in the dust of his rabbi. What is it about community that we think, we could have picked any four aspects of the biblical picture and the life of Jesus. What is it about community that we think is so important that we dedicate three months to it every year? And in order to answer that question, um, keeping with the theme of food analogies, uh, you have to ask yourself another question. And this question is probably one that you woke up asking yourself, so you may already have an answer. But the question that we all need to ask about what we were created to be and what our essential nature is like is, uh, are we grapes or are we marbles? Are we grapes or are we marbles? Which one are we? And so let me, let me explain what I mean. These are actually somewhat uh, on their face, you know, similar objects. They're both small spherical objects. Depending on your eyesight or your context, you might even confuse one for the other. Like if I told you I was going to throw you a grape and I threw you a marble, you'd have to like catch it and examine it before you could realize that I actually threw you a marble and was trying to choke you because um, they are similar enough on their face to be confused for one another and yet they were designed and they were created for very different reasons in very different ways to fulfill very different specific purposes and the way in which they flourish and achieve that which they were created to do happens through very different means. Let me give you an example. When you think about a marble, um, a marble is a small and round object, and it's usually around other marbles, right? I mean, you rarely find one singular marble. It's usually in some sort of jar or container or box around other marbles in community with those marbles, connected to those marbles. But that connection is purely incidental. And what I mean by that is it is not essential for the marble to be the marble that it was created to be. Its connection to other marbles, its proximity, its community is not what makes this a marble. In fact, I could throw the marble over here and it's going to roll and it's still a marble. And actually, I come back tomorrow and go over there and it's still going to be a marble. And if uh, I come back in two weeks and no one's moved it, it's still going to be a marble. And if I come back in two years, it's still going to be a marble because that marble is independent and that marble is self-sufficient. It does not need the other marbles to be what it was created to be. And you juxtapose that with grapes and grapes are also small round objects and they're usually found in community with other grapes, right? And they're connected to this stem and if you go out into nature or to a vineyard, they're connected to a vine and that vine and that stem is actually the delivery system for all of the nutrients that allow this grape to be a grape. So the reason that the grape flourishes and thrives and survives is because it is connected to the other grapes. There's no other way in which this grape can be healthy. In fact, if I treat the grape the same way I treat the marble, as independent and self-sufficient, I remove it from its stem and I throw it over to where I threw the marble and I come back tomorrow and the process of death and decomposition will have already began. And if I come back in two weeks, that grape will probably not even have any remnants of it remaining because total decomposition, dust to dust. Because unlike the marbles, the grapes are not self-sufficient. They're not independent. They are actually inherently dependent. And more than that, they're interdependent on the community in which they live. And when the community is healthy, the grapes are healthy. When the grape gets disconnected from a healthy community, it withers and it dies. It cannot flourish outside of meaningful, healthy community. And so the question for us is which one do we think we are? Are we marbles or are we grapes? And the spoiler is that 514 Church believes that we were, that we're grapes. Well, we believe that we're grapes. No matter how much we try to act like marbles, we're actually grapes. Community is essential in our flourishing, right? The, the grain along which God has created this world and us is for us to be plugged into community like grapes. And when we don't, the consequences are, are drastic. They're, they're dramatic. They're devastating. 
And so what our position is, because of our theology from the Bible that informs our anthropology, our understanding of humans, is that we were created for community. We were created for community. It's nothing that you can condition into yourself or condition out of yourself. It's simply stamped on you from the beginning. It is something that's written on your hearts, into your DNA. You were created to live in this world and flourish as a part of a community. Now, one of the reasons that we have to talk about this is because most people in this room, if I asked that question and I gave you truth serum, you would probably actually answer that you think you're more like a marble. You're around other marbles a lot, and that's not bad. Like, sometimes that's good, and actually, usually I'm around them, but they're not what allows me to flourish. That's not how I flourish. I'm independent. I'm self-sufficient, right? That's the American dream. That is Western individualism. That's the ethos that we have been told, right? We make our own success. That's what we tell ourselves. That's what we, we've built uh, our ideology on, right? Um, one time at the Grammys, Kanye West, wise sage, was asked, who inspired you to go on this musical career trajectory that's unlike that we've seen before? He said, I inspired me. I inspired me. And we laugh at Kanye because we kind of think Kanye is ridiculous. But if you read any autobiography of any successful person, they might shout out their mom and they might shout out a mentor. But the real point of the book is that they got to where they were because they work harder than everybody else. In some ways, they're better than everybody else. They grinded longer than everybody else. They slept less than everybody else. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not. That is the narrative that we give to success. To be strong, to be successful, is to be independent. To need somebody else in order to flourish. To need other people is a sign of weakness. That's what we tend to believe as American Christians. And number one, you know, that's not true. <laughs> uh, it's just simply not true from a sociological perspective. We have lots of ways in which community shapes us whether we want it to or not. It's not very true that, that you are purely an autonomous individual thriving or dying in this world based purely on yourself. Um, and, and secondarily, um, it's very damaging to the way that we think about community. If we think that we're marbles, then you will treat communities as such, incidental. I'll be there when I can get there. Not that important, because if that's not what allows me to flourish, if that's not an essential ingredient in my human flourishing, then why would I prioritize it all the other, over all the other things I have going on in my life? You won't, and we don't. And so one thing that we have to do is correct this mistaken worldview, this myth of individualism. And uh, one of the greatest Bible teachers of all time, he's a living today, he's young actually, his name's Tim Mackey, and he's the creator of the Bible Project, and he was one of my professors in seminary, and what he told me was whenever you have these existential questions about how you were created to be, how you were created to live, what the purpose is that, that is just in your being, um, you can go to a lot of places in the Bible but you should always go back to the beginning. You should always go back to the beginning when you have these big questions about what it means to be a human. Questions about creation should be addressed in the creation story. And so today, I just wanna walk us back and I wanna talk about this creation narrative. And I think that there's some really interesting things that we typically treat as background noise that are actually very informative on this topic of community and flourishing. And so we'll go to the end of Genesis chapter 1. God has created a good world that's organized and beautiful and fit for the flourishing of life. And at the end, he creates human beings. And this is what it says starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over all, uh, every living creature. And God saw all that he had created. And behold, it was very good. What do you notice about that? What do you notice about that, that passage? There's not very many singular pronouns, right? There's not very many singular pronouns in the creation story. In fact, 
When God refers to God's own self, he uses plural pronouns. Interesting, let us create mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now there's a Hebrew word for me and a Hebrew word for my, and it's not the words that's used in Genesis chapter one. He says, let us create mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now this, this is a point of, of biblical study that's disputed to some degree, so by no means is this settled. Um, but you know what Christians, in terms of orthodoxy, have, have tended to believe is that this moment is a mention, the first mention of this idea of the Trinity. That the God that we worship is actually three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three individual persons in one Godhead. One plus one plus one equals one. Diversity within unity. It's this beautiful picture of God. It's very complicated. And so we don't have time to, to dig into that, but let's assume that that's true. Let's assume that he's using plural pronouns because he himself has diversity within his unity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Then what that means is that God is inherently communal. It's who he is. He has been in eternal relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, with each other the whole time, forever. So did God love before he created the world? Yes, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and an eternal loving relationship. Did God have relationship before he created his creation? Yes, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's who God is. It doesn't say why God is that way. It just says that God is this way, inherently communal. And humans are created in his image, which means that we are representations of him made in his likeness. And so if God is definitionally, and it just in terms of his very being, communal, and we are his images, then humans are inherently communal. Which means that we don't have a choice. This isn't something that we get to choose. It's not something that you're either strong enough to not be or you're weak enough and you have to be. This is just who we are. This is what it means to be a human. And I don't know why God did that, and the Bible does not tell us why God did that, but that is the way that God created us. Another way to say this is that we were created for community. This is stamped on us. It's written into us. Now, sometimes people think that, that the Bible and science are incompatible, and that's almost always not true. That's almost always bad readings of the scripture, both from Christians and from opponents of Christianity. The Bible and science foundationally usually agree with each other, and this is the case right here, because evolutionary psychologists and sociologists will tell you that we are hyper-social animals, humans, which means that we cannot live apart from each other. We must be connected. We must be in community in order for our humanity to thrive. And that's exactly what the Bible says. Same thing. We were created for community. It's just who we are. And so if this is true for us to live a real flourishing life because this is the way that we were created, then it also means that that this is true of our faith. In order for our life to flourish, we must be connected to real community. And in order for our faith to flourish, we must be connected in real community. Why would we think that we are these inherently social, relational beings, and yet our faith is going to thrive just as a private thing, away from everybody else? It doesn't make any sense. It's illogical. It's impossible. It's true of our life, and so it's true of our faith. Our faith requires community to flourish. Our faith, if we want our faith to grow, if we want our faith to flourish, it requires community. There is no way around it. If you are not connected to other people who are trying to do this countercultural, difficult journey of following God, you won't thrive. You won't, because you weren't created to. And it's not your fault, just not how you were made to be. Uh, N.T. Wright says, he says this, he says, it is as impossible, unnecessary, and undesirable to be a Christian all by yourself as it is to be a newborn baby all by yourself. The church is first and foremost a community, a collection of people who belong to one another because they belong to God, the God we know in and through Jesus. It is as impossible, unnecessary, and undesirable to be a Christian all by yourself as it is to be a newborn baby all by yourself. What happens if a newborn baby is all by itself? It cannot flourish. I'm at that age where my friends, you know, my sisters and my good friends have brought children into this world and against all odds, successfully raising them to be real people. 
And I've gotten to watch this. And one of the things that I always find darkly humorous about uh, babies is that they're born, and then for the first however many years of their life, they do everything they can to not flourish. They make all the wrong decisions. They refuse all the things they should want. You know, a lot of babies, like, won't eat. And you sit there and you're like, if, if you don't eat, you, you're not going to survive. Why are, you, why are you fighting me on this very basic survival instinct? Same, same with sleep. Well, why would you not sleep? It's good for you. Like, stop doing that. Uh, toddlers uh, become mobile, which is frightening. And they just walk around in rooms and look for the most dangerous thing and find it and try to hurt themselves with it. This is a picture of my nephew, Mac. All right, he's one and a half. I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, He's hurting me, which apparently brings him great pleasure. Uh, But as you can see from this picture, you know, I'm pretty high in the air. He is not worried at all. Like he could fall backwards, fall forwards, both of which would probably hurt him very badly. Not concerned. Not concerned in the slightest. In fact, he loves this. Sometimes when I watch him, I just look at his eyes and he looks around and he finds the highest place and then he climbs up and he doesn't even try to stay on it. He like tries to fall off. And if you're not there to catch them, like they, you will hurt. That's how babies are. That's funny. It's funny that our brains develop like that. But if you think about your faith, that's what we're all doing when we refuse community. When we don't prioritize connecting to Christian community, we're just like babies who are trying to do the very thing that they should not do, that are refusing to do the thing that's going to allow them to flourish. That's how a lot of us are living in our lives. We are, we are resisting the commitment of connecting to people in our faith walk, in our church, in small groups. We're resisting this, or at least we're deprioritizing it because we're not quite convinced that we need it in order for our walk with God to flourish and thrive, but your faith requires community to flourish. I have lived this. I've lived this. My story is that the first time I heard the gospel, I was in high school. I was a freshman, 15 years old, and it took me seven years of wrestling and wondering and doubting to actually decide that I believe this thing and I want to chase it down. I was a junior in college, and I was a part of Young Life in high school. And I loved going to Young Life, and I loved being there. But the people that I was actually connected to in high school, most of them, were not interested in a walk with Jesus at all. And therefore, I wasn't very interested in a walk with Jesus at all. And when I went to college, um, I am almost positive that all hope of me Uh, moving into a relationship with Jesus and starting this Christian walk would have been nil, except I was dating my now wife, Jenna, who was leading Young Life at Ohio State. And I had this one connection, this one connection to strong Christian community. And I think that that is the only reason that I'm a Christian today. But because that was my only connection, my faith in college was certainly not thriving. Because I didn't have that close Christian community that you need in order for your relationship with God to flourish. If you fast forward a a few years, um, I worked at Abercrombie for five years. And in 2016, I had this, this like feeling that I was being pulled away from that job. And I loved that job. And I thought I was pretty good at that job. And I thought I was on a good path in that job. And I felt like I was being pulled away. And if you've ever been in that situation, that is terrifying. You don't want to leave something that you're comfortable with. That was absolutely terrifying. I didn't know what to do. And so besides talking to to Jenna, the one person that I talked to about this was my small group leader. We've been in this small group for five years. We decided to connect and commit. And I talked to my small group leader, Joel Kovacs. And I said, hey, uh, I think I want to leave this job and I think I want to do something in like the nonprofit world. That's kind of where my heart's always been. How should I get involved in that? Where, who should I talk to? Where should I go? And he said, you want to work for 514 Church? <laughs> and well, I did. Um, the point of the story is not where I ended up. It's who did I talk to when that real situation was happening? Who did I go to? I went to my small group leader. Because that's a real relationship, a real brotherhood, a real friendship that was built with real bonds, time and energy with each other, invested in each other's lives, living with each other in community 
and taking on the burdens of one another as they came up. That's what small groups do. That's what small groups are designed to do. A healthy small group, you're living your life with these people. And when you have that, man, that is an essential ingredient in order for you to flourish in your faith. And so the challenge that we're going to give out to the church over the next three weeks is that if you want to flourish, if you want to grow in your faith, if you want to move towards true discipleship, if you want to live as you were created to live and flourish in your faith, you have to embrace your grapeness. You got to embrace the fact that you're a grape. Stop pretending to be a marble. Stop thinking that that makes you strong and independent. It doesn't. It makes you a fork trying to spread peanut butter. It makes you a grape pretending to be a marble. It doesn't make you a marble. You need community in order for your faith to flourish and grow, which is what we're all here to do. You must be connected to a solid community. It is the only way that I myself have ever been in the position to really truly grow in my faith. All of it is owed to when I did and didn't have community, at least as a foundation. And so one thing that we offer here at 514 Church, okay, one thing that we do here is we try to set up our entire community, our entire city to function like this so that we understand that we're grapes and we have the opportunity to live as such, okay? The mission of this church, if you don't know this, is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. That means if you're not in a relationship, we want you to come into a relationship. And if you are in a relationship or you come into one, we want you to grow in that relationship with God. We want everybody in this church to flourish and, and grow and move towards Christ-centered life, a life of discipleship. And the strategy that we have created all the way back from when Joel first started this church, he has the booklets in his house. The strategy that we created in order to move people into a growing relationship with Jesus is very simple. It's two things. Large group, small group. This is what we do. And everything that goes into that, all the teaching, all the curriculum, all the events, it's all this idea that sometimes we gather as large groups and then we have these smaller, more tight-knit, close relational communities. Your kids have this. Your students have this, middle school, high school, and adults have this. This is what we do. It's the whole point. It's the way that we think we grow and thrive and flourish in our faith. Now, just to say a couple things about these before we wrap this up, you know, large group is this really, this, that's what this is, by the way. This is large group. This is the gathering of people. And this is a really holy and sacred moment. I mean, really, this is a sacred time for us. You know, when you gather together with other people who are trying their best to put Jesus in the center of their life, saying that this is the most important thing in my life, even though it's not the most important thing to the world, and we gather together as a community and we sing worship songs to God, and we praise the God that we've tried to put into the center of our life, and we pray together, not because we're supposed to, but because we think the Spirit moves when we do that. And, and when we read the Scriptures together, that's the revelation of God. That is powerful to sit in a room with 200, 300 people and do that. And then when we have hopefully qualified people to stand up here and talk about what the Scriptures mean and how we apply that to our life in our world, man, that's a powerful time to be here. I'm always shocked when people say, yeah, I'm not really getting anything from Sunday mornings anymore. I'm always kind of like, well, what are you there to do? Because that is holy, man. That is powerful. God moves in this space. We are to make this a priority as Christians because of what the implications are for our community and for strengthening us. And then the other thing that we do with small groups, like I told you about my story with Joel, um, I'm still with my original small group. And not all small groups have the same trajectory. But I'm still with my small group. And, and these people I'm very, very, very close to. These are the people that I live my life with. If I have a crisis, if I need something, the, the people in that group are the people I'm going to call because I've lived with them. Uh, we get together and we talk about the scriptures. We talk about questions we have. We talk about the Bible. We talk about our lives. We talk about kids. We talk about challenges and struggles and hardships. And we talk about celebration and beauty together. Do you have people in your life that you do that with? Outside of my small group, I really don't. 
And so this is really important and sacred. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is that I think that we all want to grow in our faith. If you're a part of this church community and you want to grow and you want to thrive, and the way that we think we move towards discipleship is large group, small group, and you have deprioritized either of those two things, and you're not in a small group or you don't really attend small group, and you don't really come to Sunday mornings very often, then it really shouldn't be a surprise that your faith feels stagnant if it does, that it feels like you're not moving in the right direction if you're not. It feels like your tires are spinning because this is what we were designed to do. This is how we were created. And this church is not perfect. And everybody in this room is, is not perfect. And the staff is not perfect. And our small group leaders are not perfect. And therefore, our small groups are not always perfect. And yet, sometimes, usually, that connection that we build in those small groups that you guys have with each other, man, that is the essential grounding of the growth of our faith. And if we don't have that, we're grapes pretending to be marbles, and there are parts of us that are withering away. Our faith walk will be like trying to spread peanut butter with a fork, and it will be frustrating because we're trying to do something that we were not designed to do, but we don't have to. We don't have to live like that. There is opportunity to plug in, to connect. You can write it on the card that you have in front of you today. We're going to talk about it next week. We're going to talk about it the week after that. Um, we have an opportunity, you know, to take just an initial step of creating a community of people with yourself that you can actually use as a launching pad into growth and into flourishing and into a life that looks like you're covered in the dust of Rabbi Jesus, transformed into his likeness. And that's the whole reason that we're here today. And that is beautiful. And so I'm going to pray for us, and uh, we'll get out of here. God, thank you for this community of people. I want to thank you, first of all, in my own life, in my own experience, in the way that community in the Christian world, real community, has shaped my faith, that I know that I am where I am today because I got plugged in. And I know that the times in my life when I try to live my faith out apart from other people, by myself, in isolation, is the times when I feel furthest away from you, when my, my faith feels most frustrating and when growth seems most unattainable. God, I pray that everybody in this church today that has an opportunity to plug into a small group, that they do it that we prioritize Sunday mornings because gathering together in your name is powerful in community with each other, that we prioritize our small groups because that is essential to us following you and becoming like you. God, I pray that you move us, that you break down the walls, that whatever it is we're scared of, whatever it is that we're resisting, whatever we've prioritized over that, that you shape us and change us and move us and allow us to be vulnerable and to take that step towards true discipleship and flourishing just the way that we were always created to be. Anybody in this room who has had a negative experience, God, I pray that you help them heal from that. I pray that, that you give them the wherewithal and the strength and the endurance to try again in a small group, to try again, to try. Because not having it is not an option. And so I pray that anything that's happened, that you heal and that we're able to move into closer relationship with each other, and therefore our faith is able to flourish. God, it is in your name we pray. Amen. Once we were dead, but we're now alive, brought back to life. By the blood of Christ, once we were dead, but we're now alive, brought back to life. By the blood of Christ, once we were dead, and we're now alive, brought back to life. By the blood of
the scars on our King, and death is no more. We're restored by the cross. We are set free. Let's sing it again. Come on. We're set. the cross we are set free Jesus died for me the, uh, the analogy of a baby not eating food it just struck me when John was talking because you know as parents we've all been there and when your kid doesn't eat food that you feed them, you don't just stop feeding them food. You find out something else to feed them because they still have to eat. And so some of you are in here and, you know, small groups, when, when 10 years ago when I was like, oh, large group, small group, I didn't, I didn't create that idea. That was like a, a system that I saw that I really appreciated and I wanted to make happen here. So it's not a new idea. Small groups are, are, are something that, that a lot of you have been involved in. You've done a small group. And if it hasn't worked, like John's sentiment in his prayer, if it hasn't worked, that doesn't mean, like he said, that you stop eating. You just need to try again. You need to find something else. You gotta figure it out. You gotta find that connection. You have to understand that if you don't find it, that your life is at stake. Instead of just going, oh, well, this didn't work, so I'm gonna stop eating. So I love that message, John. That is probably one of the greatest messages I've ever heard. We'll see you guys next week. We love you.